on their service life. So they were just, they're just basically bonus and we're fortunate to have them flying still. They, we did not, they were not engineered to last this long. So with that surplus, we are having discussions with the Department of Defense because they have a gap in the Indian Ocean uh, region and the Western Pacific. And so we, if we, well, we continue to operate those extra satellites. We'll, we'll share some of that data with us. We're having discussions to potentially use one of them for the Department of Defense mission. So you would, would they, would you be giving it to them or would they just have access to that information? How would that, how would that be? Well, we're not, we're not resourced to operate uh, for them in that orbit, but we, we would probably partner in some way and we're, those, that's where the focus of our discussions right now. Okay, so no decision has been made yet. Are y'all still in discussions on that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the uh, GOES and J JPSS uh, and their uh, predecessors have provided critical weather and uh, Earth observation data for decades and remain uh, primary in uh, input for uh, uh, weather models. Uh, but space is evolving, as, as we know. Launches are getting cheaper, and space is no longer just the uh, domain of governments. What is NOAA doing to take advantage of these changes and lower the cost of our uh, observing infrastructure? We have uh, several eff efforts underway, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one is that we're studying the uh, potential of using commercial satellite data for our weather models. And so we were in the second year of a pilot project to, to study that. Uh, we also are conducting a, a fairly extensive uh, satellite architecture study. Uh, in, and in that study, we are assessing the potential for future commercial capabilities and integrating those within our current satellite programs uh, using either commercial data um, or, um, uh, or even uh, different satellite designs like nanosats and cubesats. And the, uh, I understand that uh, the commercial weather data uh, pilot program has gotten off? Yes, sir. To a slower start than, than was first ex expected. Is that correct? I, I don't think we had a, it was, it's a modest endeavor. We, we don't have a, a large amount of funds dedicated to it, and it was primarily a kind of crawl, walk, run effort where we envision just looking at one type of data, radio occultation, and, and then in the, in the future, uh, should we uh, receive more appropriations funding to conduct studies like this, we would look at other types of data. Oh, and what would be your next steps for the pilot program? We, we are, we are, we've done the radio occultation study. We're going to examine that a little more as, as new, new commercial sources become available. And the idea would be in the future we look at other data types. Uh, it could be anything from sea surface temperature to atmospheric measurements. From what you uh, observe afar, this far from the pilot program, is there any particular what's maybe some of the things that stood out as far as things you've learned from that? Well, one of the things we've learned is the industry isn't evolving as fast as we thought it would. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the radio occultation systems that are available commercially are very few in number. I think there's only one company currently that pro it has the potential to provide it. So, uh, um, it's, but then again, Secretary Ross, uh, my, my boss in the Department of Commerce, he's been uh, involved in a pretty active campaign to promote the development of commercial space capabilities. And so uh, we anticipate growth in that area. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Serrano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Admiral, <clears throat> the hurricanes last year caused significant damage to NOAA facilities and equipment in the south and southeast of the United States, as well as Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. The recently enacted bill provides funding for repairs or replacement of those uh, facilities and equipment. Can you give us an update as to how that's going? Sure, and I want to thank you very much, uh, Congressman Serrano and this entire uh, subcommittee for appropriating that disaster supplemental funding. We, are, we will put that to very good use. Uh, currently, we have a spend plan uh, for the $200 million allocated for the, the weather damage and weather research that we'll uh, use those funds for, and it's uh, currently at the Office of Management and Budget under review. Uh, we intend of that $200 million, that uh, $100 million will be dedicated to uh, weather research and improved weather forecasting and warning. And then, um, and then we'll have another about uh, the other 100 million will be used for a number of uh, different things like marine debris remo removal in Puerto Rico and in the southeast uh, caused by the hurricanes. And then there's also another 200 million that will be applied to fisheries disasters along the Gulf Coast in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and even some West Coast fisheries that where disasters were, were uh, declared uh, last year.
No, is that money flowing already or will be flowing? Not yet. The OMB has to approve it, in our, our spend plan. And as soon as they do, we will start. Uh, and we're lining up uh, you know, our contracts and all the work to be done uh, so we can execute as soon as those, those, those funds are available. Uh, regarding uh, Puerto Rico, we have um, much uh, underway already uh, in, in terms of removing marine debris, uh, performing post-storm assessments. We worked with the Department of Defense to get a weather radar uh, to replace the damaged one that we had. We ha operated uh, there. And, um, and I'll tell you personally, I, ha I have great sympathy and appreciation for all the people of Puerto Rico. Uh, during Hurricane Katrina, my house on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi was entirely washed away in 28 feet of storm surge. And so uh, I have personal knowledge of, what, of the sacrifices and loss they have experienced. And so you can be assured personally I'll be providing as much uh, support and, and, and personal involvement that I can to ensure we can re recover quickly. Thank you. <laughs> the budget is presented by the administration cuts uh, 248 funded positions from field offices of the National Weather Service. And uh, we know how important the National Weather Service is, especially these days. So, uh, Admiral, won't these further cuts in weather service personnel, as proposed by the President, create a very real risk of reduced timelines and accuracy in weather forecasting? Uh, Congressman, thank you for your, your interest in, in the Weather Service and support. Uh, they are all heroes, in my opinion. I visited a number of the weather forecast offices, and they've made great sacrifices during the storm season. I've seen in Houston, for example, uh, the, the forecasters were there in the office five days straight, sleeping in the office, providing warnings and, uh, to emergency managers, and, and that's just one of many examples. The, uh, to answer your question, uh, we don't believe that that reduction in number of positions will introduce significant risk. In fact, uh, there's been three studies on the workforce at the Weather Sur Service, and all have concluded that the Weather Service can operate more efficiently. Uh, there are just a number of either operating practices, like uh, reducing the number of forecasters on, on watch or even the hours any given weather field forecast office operates, uh, as well as using automation and, uh, and improved processing technologies like the one I mentioned uh, in my opening statement, the AWIPS. So technology and uh, better, better um, business practices at the weather service, I think, will allow for us to absorb uh, the reductions in, in, in people in this budget. Admiral, my last question for this round, uh, the silliest question you'll get all day today, but it's just something I came up with last night. So whenever I turn on the TV or the radio, whatever, I hear the weather forecast, they get that from you guys, right? They don't do their own weather forecasting. Actually, TV meteorologists sometimes do their, often do their own forecast, but they get the baseline data and warning information from us. Yes, sir. I was wondering if they pay you for that. Uh, our, our taxpayer dollars pay for us. That has become, you know. The American taxpayers pay for our uh, service, sir. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Palazzo. <coughs> well, thank you, Mr. <coughs> Chairman. Admiral Gallaudet, it's great to see you again. Thank you for being here today. Um, during last year's hearing, Secretary Ross made a commitment to me and to this subcommittee to work with the Gulf states to find a solution to better manage our red snapper fisheries. And Admiral, you and I have spoken about this issue as well. Uh, fast forward to today, this administration has stood by these commitments. And I want to first say how much I and my Gulf colleagues appreciate the willingness of this administration to work with our states and the recreational fishing community on ways to improve red snapper management, and which, as everyone knows, is by far the most popular and contentious offshore fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and I'm proud of the work that Mississippi and the other Gulf states have put into developing proposals that will allow each of the states to manage recreational fishermen in both state and federal waters over the next two years. Uh, Mississippi is more than capable of managing its fishery in a way that ensures con conservation while maximizing access, and I believe it should be given the maximum management flexibility possible under this proposal. And I know that the question uh, I'm about to ask it very easily be answered any time this week or, or next week. Uh, so without being a spoiler, um, Admiral, will you commit NOAA Fisheries to working with Mississippi and the other states to ensure these proposals are approved and provide whatever assistance is needed to ensure their success? Uh, yes, Congressman, we will. And, and I think the Red Snapper story this year is a fantastic one, especially in the light of the last year's uh, season. 
And so I think we're going to be very successful, and I will work with Mississippi and all the Gulf states in, in managing the, in co-managing -co the red snapper fishery. Thank you for that commitment. Um, shifting gears a little bit, as you know from your own science background as the cr and career as oceanographer of the Navy, uh, maintaining the competitive edge in the maritime environment is critical for both defense and non-defense. Uh, there is legislation introduced in both the House and Senate for the purpose of developing a NOAA Navy program for the assessment and acquisition of unmanned maritime systems to the benefit of several NOAA offices, including ocean exploration and research. However, the President's budget has reduced or eliminated programs that aim to maintain that competitive edge, especially through competitive programs and cooperative institutes with the university scientists, such as with the University of Southern Mississippi, my alma mater, and others. Uh, what is your strategy for maintaining the United States' competitive advantage in the area advanced technology rel relevant to the NOAA mission, especially in unmanned maritime systems and ocean exploration with such dramatic reductions to the budget? So, Congressman, I, I understand and appreciate your interest and support of our, our technology development, certainly with respect to ocean capabilities, as well as uh, the unmanned systems work we are doing and we've discussed together personally. And so, yes, it, the, the budget choices uh, in terms of the unmanned systems uh, work in our Office of Ocean and Atmospheric Research, as, as well as many others that are important, uh, we made because this administration is committed to uh, prioritizing national security funding and in that from my past experience in the Navy I, I, I support that prioritization and so we had to cut we decided to reduce programs that we felt were either redundant or had uh, were, were primarily uh, supporting grants to local or, st or local stakeholders or states and it was the core government work that we, we uh, preserved the with respect to unmanned systems and uh, ocean exploration, it, it, we're, we didn't zero those out. So even though we removed the unmanned systems research effort, there is still a vast amount of great unmanned work going on all across NOAA. Our fisheries, for example, are doing amazing things, serving marine mammals and, uh, and, and acoustically with unmanned surface vehicles and underwater vehicles. Uh, looking at fish and fish stocks uh, that in ways that are just much more efficient and cost savings compared to the, our previous efforts. And so we're, we're flying drones, we're doing underwater and, uh, and on surface type of activity and, uh, and advancing that still in, our, in, in the current line of funding we have today. Um, but I will look forward to working with you and, and, the, and the Navy uh, going forward to see how we can best continue those operations and the research and de development behind it. Well, thank you, Admiral. Thank you for your service, and um, with that, I yield back. Thanks, Congressman. Ms. Ming. Uh, thank you, Admiral, for being here. I wanted to ask a question uh, about a project that is near my district. Uh, the National Center for Coastal Ocean Science funds a critical research project uh, called Mapping the Long Island Sound Floor. Uh, the Long Island Sound is vital to the region's economy, security, and ecology. Um, as you know, the challenge for effective coastal planning is balancing the demands of proposed development uh, activities such as telecommunication cables, gas pipelines, and other infrastructure uh, while ensuring the sustainability and health of marine environments there. Uh, your budget proposes significant cuts to the account that funds this project and proposes to eliminate a number of navigation observations and positioning grants programs under the National Ocean Service that impact these projects. Um, please explain why you think these programs should be eliminated. Sure, Congressman Meng. Thanks for your question. Thanks for your support of our National Ocean Service and, and the, the offices under it. Uh, the, the Ocean Service is a particularly um, high interest item for me uh, as uh, with my degrees in oceanography and the fact that I've been a coastal uh, state resident in three states uh, for my entire adult life. Um, and overseas, and so I and currently live on the Chesapeake Bay, and I very much enjoy and value our coast and all the work that the Ocean Service does. Uh, th with respect to the project you mentioned, uh, again, our, our rationale behind the budget cuts wasn't that we thought these pro projects weren't good or valuable. Uh, it was just that we had we had to apply our cuts somewhere, 
And for, so we preserved much good work that the Ocean Service does in, in terms of coastal modeling, uh, navigation, and surveying. Uh, but it was the grants that to states that we decided to reduce because we just felt the core government services that we provided had a higher priority. It wasn't that the work wasn't important. We just had to apply the cut somewhere. Um, okay. I hope that you will continue to prioritize uh, any way that we can help. I mean, do you believe that um, piggybacking off of uh, Ranking Member Serrano's uh, comment about climate changing and that something is happening uh, within our oceans and in the climate as a whole. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, my, you, from my background in the Navy where I helped establish the Navy's Climate Change Task Force <coughs> and my scientific experience and knowledge, I am very aware of it. In fact, our organization does much great work still in terms of monitoring climate and climate change and the studies behind it, including uh, the various aspects of it, whether it be drought or sea level rise. And we're applying that information every day in studies and assessments and work with local officials uh, to help manage and adapt uh, to those changes. Great. Um, and back to hurricanes a little bit. You mentioned uh, in your testimony about the accuracy and success of many of these programs. Uh, NOAA requests a decrease of $4 million in reducing the overall computational capacity of research and development high performance computing system. Uh, this decrease will eliminate one of NOAA's super computing systems, JET, uh, located in Colorado and reduce um, the com super computing use and associated contract support in West Virginia. Um, some major transition projects include hurricane forecast improvement, next generation global prediction system, and storm surge modeling and that will no longer have use of the supercomputing system. Um, why actively seek, why are you seeking to reduce our capability to forecast storms such as Sandy that devastated uh, New York City and the tri-state area, uh, Harvey, Irma, Maria are just some examples that you've mentioned. Um, yes, Congresswoman, and forgive me for calling you Congressman up front earlier. Um, we, uh, first off, the, we, those reductions are they're not, we're not zeroing out the programs. We, are, we made reductions based on the fact that we feel the current funding is sufficient, the funding that we've proposed, still to continue to improve our work. Uh, for example, we see great opportunity for research supercomputing uh, in the cloud. And our, uh, my counterpart, the Assistant Secretary for, uh, of Commerce for Earth Observations and Predictions, Dr. Neil Jacobs, uh, comes uh, with great experience in that area, and he, he's already working on plans to leverage cloud computing for research applications. The, the other piece about improving our, our modeling and super compu high performance computing to support modeling, uh, we have much underway that is very good. And in fact, I will thank you for uh, supporting the, her the su Sandy supplemental funding because that's led to many of the great advances in our, in our weather modeling. We have a research or experimental model we call the the Global Forecast System Finite Volume Cubed, or GFSFE3, uh, that is uh, in the process of transitioning to the Weather Service. This model outperformed the European models for the hurricane track forecast for the three uh, Category 4 uh, hurricanes that made landfall. So we're, our goal is to regain world leadership, take number one back for our weather model, and we're on track to do it. We, we expect to do that before 2020. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. The gentlelady from Alabama. Well, good morning, sir. Um, Thank you. I know you can tell that this um, committee is uh, has good representation from the Gulf states. So, um, and I want to apologize up front for the coming and going. I think every single one of us have all of our subcommittees meeting at the same time right now. Um, so, I just really want to make a quick comment, and that's it. And if we have some questions, we'll submit for the record. But I just alongside my colleague, Mr. Plazo, I just want to commend you and the National Marine Fisheries Service for your collaboration and your approval um, of allowing the state of Alabama as well, uh, recreational red snapper, 
uh, season to be set at 47 days uh, in 2018 and next year as well. Uh, we all believe that cutting out uh, the federal red tape um, and getting the local and state leaders um, involved in decision making uh, is a true testament to working together. Uh, each state and fishery um, are unique in our country and have decisions um, and having decisions that are made jointly um, is key to finding the appropriate solutions. So uh, again, uh, thank you so much for all you and your partners do in allowing our fisheries in Alabama uh, and around the nation to thrive um, with innovative policies and cooperative decision makings. And I just wanna thank you for your service to our great country and appreciate you being here today very much. Oh, so, thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you for, for your support. And I'll say that the credit goes to uh, Chris Oliver, the director of our National Marine Fisheries Service. He's uh, got great experience, and he's, he's doing the right thing for our fisheries. And I thought the Red Snapper uh, management plan is exactly what it should be. Great. Thanks again. I'm being a, a role model. I yield back. <laughs> got right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, uh, good morning, Admiral. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for your many years of public service. Um, I want to follow up on uh, uh, Ms. Meng's questioning a little bit, if I can. I think we're on the same page about the importance of climate change research, and I'm going to rip through a number of quick questions sure. to make yes, sure sir. we are on the same page about this. Uh, first, uh, do you agree that the past three years have been the warmest three years in recorded history? To the best of my knowledge, yes, sir. Uh, do you acknowledge that 17 of the 18 warmest years on record have happened since uh, the millennium, 2000? I will acknowledge that, that we have seen a trend in warming. I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, do you agree the amount of carbon dioxide is higher now than at any time in the last 800,000 years? And largely due to this, uh, carbon dioxide, <coughs> uh, the IPCC believes that global temperatures are expected to increase by at least 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit during the 21st century. So I, I acknowledge that the carbon is uh, at, a, at a record high in terms of the historical record in the atmosphere and oceans. And, uh, but I, and the 2.7 degree uh, forecast rise that the IPCC for, uh, had, uh, acknowledges is also a forecast with uncertainty. Uh, do you agree that global sea level rise in the next century uh, will be better measured in feet and not inches? I acknowledge that the that sea level is rising, and again, forecasting the amount it will rise by the end of the century is, there's a significant uncertainty in our ability to do that accurately. Uh, and finally, I uh, acknowledge that we still have a lot more to learn about climate change and its dramatic effects on uh, almost everything we do. Yes, sir. So I think you and I both recognize this, the settled sci science on climate change. We both know it is an existential threat to everything we know. I think we can agree we need to uh, improve our understanding of climate change uh, so that we can adapt and mitigate its effects. Fair statement? Uh, I would say that that's, that's, it is important to continue our NOAA research behind uh, climate change because there's much we still don't know. Um, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt has repeatedly stated that carbon dioxide is not a primary contributor to the warming that we observed. Uh, did you know he said that? Yes, sir. Uh, last fall, you presented the administration's three top priorities uh, for NOAA, and let me make, make sure I have them correct before I dive into it. Uh, Number one, uh, leading the world in weather prediction. Uh, number two, minimizing the impacts from severe weather. Number three, increasing sustainable economic contributions from our fish fisheries and oceans. Have we got all that correct? Yes, Congressman. I noticed that climate change is missing, and for years NOAA has played an essential role in deepening our understanding of climate change. Uh, does that concern you? I know you said in the past that, quote, the administration will continue to support NOAA's climate mission, unquote. Are you concerned about dropping that off the list? It's, yeah, I would say it's uh, embedded within all three of those priorities, Congressman. In fact, uh, so when we talk, uh, I, I, in my opening statement, we've combined those first two priorities to what we call a weather and water priority and minimizing the impacts of extreme events. 
And so that involves events on scales uh, that are in weeks to seasonal and even sub-seasonal and, and, and climate type of scales. All right. I'm looking at the numbers in your budget request, and it seems to me the administration has proposed to cut NOAA by over a billion dollars. Uh, that's about a 20 percent cut. Am I reading that correctly? Yes, sir. Um, well, that's troubling. Uh, let's talk about some of these cuts. Uh, Admiral, uh, let's look how they align with the administration's priorities for NOAA, how they align with our shared understanding. Budget proposes stripping $2.4 million from regional climate centers, which answer millions of requests from businesses, farmers, and local communities every year. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir. Uh, it'll eliminate the climate, climate resilience grants to states. Now, the climate resilience grants uh, show us that it, for every one dollar invested in resilience results in uh, six dollars in savings uh, from e e future extreme weather damages. Am I correct in that? I don't know the exact numbers, sir, but I know that there's uh, the work our, our climate predictions provide to the country saves money and lives. Uh, the budget will eliminate the climate competitive research grants, right? Yes, sir. Uh, it'll dismantle, and that's the language the administration used, uh, the climate program office as it currently exists, right? I'm unaware of that. I, that office is still funded in the FY19 budget, sir. Uh, the budget will cut research on ocean acidification by 23.4 percent. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir. Uh, even though ocean acidification can potentially harm and deplete our fishing stocks, right? We're, uh, we're still continuing, even though there's a reduction in the funding, we still continue to do that research to support uh, uh, shellfish growers, for example, in the state of Washington. So, it, it, yes, there are reductions in the program, but we're still looking at it, studying it, and supporting those who are affected by it. We'll come back to this, but the budget also proposes decreases to hurricane forecasting uh, research, doesn't it? Even though hurricanes cost our country uh, uh, an eye-popping 306 billion dollars in damages last year, and even though uh, 400,000 American citizens in Puerto Rico are still without power over seven months after Hurricane Maria, correct? The, so the rationale, as I mentioned earlier, Congressman, was not to, we didn't remove all hurricane research, for example. Uh, as I mentioned to Congresswoman Meng, uh, we have a very solid and robust research program supporting hurricane uh, forecast research. I went down to our Atlantic and, uh, Oceanography and Meteorology Laboratory last week in Miami that has a hurricane research division and they have made, uh, they are and continue and will be doing in this FY19 budget terrific work to improve our hurricane forecasting and the research behind it. So we haven't zeroed it out. We have just made reductions in various areas we thought either were redundant or were, uh, uh, we had sufficient capability. I, uh, I think we'll come back to this, but at this point, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Let me um, switch gears and talk a little bit about, we've talked a little bit about hurricanes. Let me switch, uh, talk a little bit about uh, tornadoes, uh, as we had mentioned briefly before the uh, hearing started. Uh, of course, tornadoes in the southeast uh, result in more deaths per capita than any other region of the United States. Uh, since 2015, we have been funding the Vortex uh, Southeast uh, program, <coughs> SE program, uh, which uh, brings together meteorologists, researchers, and social sci scientists to better understand the storms and conditions that cause tornadoes in the southeastern part of the United States. Uh, can you share a little bit about what the program has accomplished thus far and uh, how it will help protect uh, the folks that I represent back in uh, Alabama uh, from these deadly tornadoes? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. The, the Vortex program, I think, is a, a terrific one. Yeah, over the last year, I know that our, it's been managed by our, our National Severe Storm Lab in Oklahoma, but they have partners in your state uh, that they've actively done field research in to study uh, the damage, for example, at, at diff where, where different tornadoes have occurred in Alabama. And then with that information, they've been able to reduce the uncertainty in, in, in tornado warnings and predictions and also better understand um, 
the, the decision support type of work and how we provide warnings to emergency managers and, and the advice they should give the uh, people uh, because, of the, um, because of the different nature of the storms in that, let's say, your region to those, let's say, in Texas. And so there's been great, I think, ad advances made by that program. I, I know you're concerned about the fact that the 19 budget uh, reduces that funding in, for the Vortex program. And again, that was one where we, we felt that the severe, National Severe Storm Lab was still doing with their, their, their baseline funding, uh, had a good tornado warning uh, for a research program uh, as required by the Weather Act I mentioned in my opening statement. So we didn't pull back all the fund, uh, research in terms of tornado warning, and, um, but we, also, we made a reduction based again on what we thought was a sufficient level of capability. Well, please know, you know, that is certainly important to us in, um, in the southeast and, of course, in Alabama, my home state. Um, it is my understanding that uh, half of NOAA's ships are past their uh, designated service life um, and are scheduled to retire by 2028. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, in light of that, um, NOAA has proposed $75 million each year to recapitalize its fleet. Uh, before buying new ships uh, for NOAA, we uh, want to ensure that NOAA is uh, fully utilizing commercial and partner uh, assets. How does NOAA determine whether a mission can be completed by a partner vessel? Or are there additional missions that NOAA can use uh, external ships to complete or reduce pressure on the NOAA fleets? <clears throat> well, yes, sir. We, we perform uh, our, our oceanographic and hydrographic and fisheries research work uh, with actually a kind of suite where we have our own vessels, um, but we also match that with sometimes contracted vessel support. Uh, we, we do this in hydrography all the time. Um, in fact, I'd say it's, it's roughly, I think, 43% of our, our hydrographic surveys are contracted. Uh, the reason I think we can't entirely contract and use partner vessels, and even though, you know, because ships are expensive, is the fact that there's just some, some, some capabilities and instances where we'll need a government-only solution. A great example was the hurricane season, sir. NOAA ship Thomas Jefferson was able to go in to Puerto Rico and all around the southeast, actually, right after the storms hit and do critical hydrographic surveys to open ports. Uh, that ship opened up 18 ports in as many days. Uh, following Hurricane Maria in, in, in the Rio Virgin Islands and in, in uh, Puerto Rico. And so that was something we, a surge capability, we just couldn't contract out. Okay. Uh, let me go ahead, Ms. Toronto. <clears throat> Maybe this is not a question for you but for other people, but I'd like to get an answer for as many people as I can. Right after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, and the devastation that we saw, that many people claim is the worst ever under the American flag. Uh, it took such a long time for things to get going. And some of the excuses they were giving was that Puerto Rico was an island, you know, and I sarcastically or profoundly sarcastically said it was easy to invade it in 1898, so it was probably not difficult to reach it now, uh, what was the problem? Was it was it uh, administrative delays? Was it indifference, if you're free to say that? Is it the fact that it's a territory and they don't play in the same ball field as states? I mean, something went wrong. Here goes that phrase again. Something went wrong. And even people who are keeping quiet about it because they don't want to attack the administration or the agencies know that something went wrong. Oh, Congressman, I, again, as I mentioned earlier, based on personal experience, uh, the people of Puerto Rico have my deepest sympathy. I, I'm in my position uh, at NOAA. I really, it's not mine to comment um, on the, the the overall response of the of, of first responders and of FEMA. I met with Bar uh, Brock Long, and we have a great <coughs> great partnership. I think I can I can tell you that NOAA's response, as, as I mentioned with the ship Thomas Jefferson, and uh, much of the work we're doing now to remove derelict vessels and areas where hazardous material and oil has been spilled, uh, restore uh, habitat in many areas, that, that, and thank you again for the supplemental appropriations, which we will apply uh, to very good effect in Puerto Rico and other areas that were affected. Uh, so I can tell you that NOAA's response has been terrific, and I'm very proud of the people uh, of my organization. 
Thank you. Well, you know, I just wanted to throw more information into the uh, into the pot, if you will, because uh, I have no qualms with NOAA, NOAA and NASA, two of our favorite agencies here, you know, except you're not sending anybody out into space anytime soon, right? Uh, no, sir, no, and we're not funded to do it either. But, um, <laughs> but I'll tell you that we have some a- Some staff members only. Right? Oh, well, uh, we, my, the former administrator had some experience there, you know. <laughs> But uh, we have a very active ocean exploration program uh, with our ship Oceanus Explorer, which is discovering new things every every year, a new species, new phenomena, and I think it's a program we're really proud of. That's great. That's great. Among the many NOAA programs the administration wants to eliminate are the National Sea Grants Program and the Educational Partnership Program with minority-serving institutions. Among the many benefits these programs have provided is that they've encouraged a pipeline of talented young scientists to choose careers at NOAA. Admiral, won't the elimination of these programs harm NOAA's ability to maintain a high quality workforce in many critical areas? I mean, you've been, you've been getting a lot of talent from that, those programs. How, how difficult is it gonna be now? Well, I'll, I'll acknowledge and thank you for your support of both those programs. And, I, and I'll say that the Sea Grant program is, is, a, gr is a great one. It's been very, uh, we've recruited out of Sea Grants and the Educational Partnership Program uh, great talent. I've met uh, many of our of scientists uh, in NOAA now who are, who are veterans of those two programs. And in fact, last month, I spoke at the Education, uh, Educational Partnership Program um, event in, at Howard University and I was able to see uh, some new young students who are all doing great research in partnership with NOAA. NOAA mentors these students. Our scientists enjoy that and, uh, and we gain because of it. So I'll tell you, yes, uh, we've benefited from and, and we've, we've been able to uh, build a more diverse workforce based on those support from those two programs. So they're important. I can, only just, I can only explain to you how I have previously that we had to make some tough calls and, and when given the cuts we were required to execute. And, and so the, some of us, the core services like weather forecasting and the oceanographic and hydrographic surveys are what we preserved. Thank you. Oh, one last question here, Admiral. Could you please talk about the backlog of maintenance and repair needs at weather forecast offices? How bad is the problem? And to what extent is the backlog further harming the ability of the National Weather Service to make timely and accurate weather forecasts? Thank you, Congressman. And again, I really appreciate your support to the Weather Service. It's uh, just a really terrific organization uh, affecting Americans for the better every, every day. Uh, yes, there, we have identified um, facilities across all of the Weather Service that are in need of repair. And, and I don't believe they are posing significant risk to the mission today. We are still saving lives, protecting property all across the country, and we proved it during this hurricane season. Uh, but, but you're correct in acknowledging that I'm, I'm concerned about a number of our facilities, and that not only at the Weather Service, but across all of NOAA. And so we are looking closely at where, what we need to recapitalize uh, at fisheries too. And, and other locations to ensure our workforce has the best place to do the best job. Thank you. Uh, just one last comment, a selfish comment, but uh, important to our districts. Uh, some years ago, uh, you set up a weather station at a community center populated by a lot of young people in my community. And in all honesty, you know, the years go by, and I don't know in what condition that weather station is. If you guys could just check on it to see if it's uh, where it should be. And uh, because at one point, uh, we, we were having the local uh, cable TV channels pick up the weather forecast from the weather station at the community center, which was really a great thrill for the kids and a lot of learning, a great learning experience. So if you could just check on that, we would appreciate it. We sure will, Congressman. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Admiral, I want to pick up on, we were talking about some specific cuts, and really, uh, uh, these are, 
the overall budget is something that comes from the administration and some many of the folks in your position are treated as well this is something we have to live with that's coming down from on high and we've talked about some of the comments from the administration officials basically denying climate change a lot of the cuts seem to align with those beliefs I went through a bunch of them with you already uh, the one that may be absolutely heartbreaking to you, uh, Admiral, is uh, the administration <coughs> has proposed eliminating the Arctic Climate Research Program, hasn't it? Yes, sir. Um, I know you spent much of your career working on Arctic research. Are you concerned about the effects of the elimination of that program on our <coughs> national security? Uh, Congressman, I thank you for your interest in this important area. I am not uh, concerned because we're doing, even though that research line has been eliminated, it doesn't mean we're not doing Arctic research. I was just at the Pacific <coughs> Marine Environmental Lab in Seattle, and they have a very active program that's continuing <laughs> various lines of Arctic research, but, but not in, a, in, in the name of an Arctic research program. For example, we have, uh, we have just contracted with an uh, organization called Sail Drone that operates unmanned surface vehicles. And, uh, and we have, and we, we actually executed an Arctic survey this year, uh, it, um, just uh, I think, um, and near the Bering Sea, and and then our, our uh, and so we, we are undertaking a good amount of Arctic research in the ocean and uh, on the ice, and uh, and we operate the National Ice Center in Suitland, Maryland, which I encourage you to visit sometime. So we, we do have a fairly, we are still continuing to do Arctic research, sir. I want to talk, follow up about talking about ice. I know NOAA published its 2017 Arctic report card last December. It found that uh, Arctic uh, was warming at a rate that was unprecedented. Am I correct in that? Yes, sir. Uh, it found uh, that's something the world has not seen in the past 1,500 years. Am I, uh, am I correct in that? I don't know the exact number, sir, but it's been warming. Yes. And it's warming at twice the rate of the rest of the globe in the Arctic. That's right? correct. Last month, Arctic sea ice, which we were just talking about, hit a record low uh, never before seen in the satellite era, correct? For the winter, yes, sir. And it was 62,000 square miles smaller than the previous record set just the previous year, right? Yes, sir. Well, uh, warmth in the Arctic affects the jet stream, does it not? Yes, sir, it does. Uh, and you said that before. What you said was, quote, unlike Vegas, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. It affects the rest of the planet. Have I quoted you correctly? You've done your homework, Congressman. All right. Well, Admiral, you were the one who delivered the 2017 Arctic report card to the administration, right? Correct, yes, sir. And you said, quote, the public should have high confidence in us, unquote, and that, quote, the White House is addressing the report, acknowledging it, and factoring it into its agenda, unquote. Did you say that? That's correct. The Office of Science and Technology Policy under the White House is supporting Arctic, our Arctic research efforts. But with all these cuts to climate research, does it not seem like the White House is failing to address it and properly factor it into its agenda? Uh, again, sir, I, I think it, that the, the answer is no. Uh, Office of Science, Tec Technology, and Policy under the White House has supported, for example, our Arctic research. And, um, and the, we have not zeroed out our climate work. If you go to drought.gov or, or the Climate Prediction Center's website, you'll see that we continue to put out uh, seasonal and long-range outlooks that are benefiting Americans and businesses. In terms of drought, temperature, uh, we, are, we continue to look at, at the Arctic and support Arctic with research and forecasting. The Navy recently con completed it or is conducting, just conducted its ice exercise, something I attended two years ago up in the Chukchi Sea where two submarines uh, were, were, were basically doing research and tactical development. And, uh, and we provided forecasts and, uh, for, of the ice and the weather uh, that, that supported those, the safety of those operations. So I, I believe that uh, through NOAA, we are continuing to do very good work. We, not, we haven't eliminated our, uh, our climate work. It's just been reduced. Well, I, I, I want to leave you, you with this. I, I want to have confidence in you, Admiral Gallaudet, and I do. You are clearly a, a good scientist, uh, an able leader. Uh, 
I would say a good soldier, or in your case, sailor, Miller. Uh, sticking up for the, the folks up top. But looking at this budget, I just don't have confidence in the administration. I think there's a budget that's going to hurt our national security. I think it's going to hurt our economy. I think it's going to hurt our country and the world for generations to come. I think this is a budget written by climate deniers uh, that would derail the great work that has been going on largely under your leadership at NOAA. And I hope this committee uh, can fix the serious problems in this budget proposal. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Admiral, for being with us. Um, I've got a few things I was hoping to ask about. First off, I'd, I'd like to ask for, for a status update on the process of distributing funds to communities impacted by recent fisheries disasters. Um, as you know, uh, Congress approved $200 million in supplemental funding to support those communities, but they, um, they continue to wait for relief while the agency works to develop a plan for how to distribute those funds. Can you tell the committee what the process uh, uh, you know, when the process will be completed uh, so that those funds can get out the door. We've got communities and folks who've been waiting for years. Yes, Congressman. Th thank you for your support of NOAA and your interest in th this issue, issue of fisheries disasters. We uh, have developed a spend plan on how to, how to allocate the $200 million of funding, uh, both for the West Coast uh, fisheries disasters that were declared in 2017 and, of course, the, those that were declared in the wake of the hurricane season. Uh, and so uh, our spend plan is currently being reviewed at the department and we'll go to OMB. We hope by the end of the uh, next two weeks or so. Uh, and then when, the o when OMB approves that, then we'll be able to share, we'll share with the states uh, the, the allocations and then, then we'll figure out exactly what those will fund in concert with your state and, and others. Great. If that's something once it's cooked by OMB um, that you can share with us, it'd be very helpful. Oh, absolutely, sir. Thanks. Um, I want to shift gears and, and thank you for uh, visiting my state uh, uh, and learning more about the NOAA programs that are done in partnership with the UW uh, and, and uh, that are pretty central to the economy in the Pacific Northwest. In our neck of the woods, one of the most important programs is the IUS program, uh, which provides some real-time data about ocean con conditions that's used by fishermen and shellfish growers and a host of other uh, industries and agencies and stakeholders. Unfortunately, the FY19 budget doesn't reflect the value of this program. The proposed cut of more than 30 percent would really cripple that system and jeopardize the livelihoods of folks that, that rely on that data, uh, not to mention the impact it would have on other critical services like search and rescue and flood warnings and navigation safety that also depend on this data. Um, now that you were able to go to Washington State and see the value and success of that program, um, I'd be interested to hear whether you believe it's in the nation's best interest for NOAA to divest from, uh, from that critical program. That's a great question, uh, Congressman. And I've, I've met with all the IUS regional man managers uh, just recently in Washington, D.C., and, and I've and the, the, I will say, uh, I will agree, it's a very important and impactful program. Uh, being a career oceanographer, I, I, I get it very well. I, again, as, as I mentioned, I don't think you were in the room, but we, in, trying to, in coming up with our, our FY19 budget, we had, to, uh, we had to make some tough calls. And we decided to prioritize core government services. And so grants and local related work uh, was uh, what we had, you know, we, had, we picked to, to reduce or in some cases eliminate, not because we didn't think they were important or good, it was just that we had to prioritize. Um, finally, let me uh, ask about the role your agency plays in mitigating coastal hazards. About 40 percent of the U.S. Popula uh, population lives in coastal areas, um, so NOAA is very important in everything from uh, protecting communities from hurricanes to tsunamis to sea level rise. Unfortunately, the administration hasn't made this a priority. The district I represent is already experiencing some of the threats of sea level rise. We also happen to be a tsunami zone. Uh, so NOAA is an incredibly important partner uh, in our region from the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program to regional coastal resiliency grants. Uh, NOAA provides a lot of funding and expertise that's really important for communities like Westport, where I was uh, just last Friday, and Nia Bay. Um, ocean shores. I could give you countless examples from my home state, but the fact is every single coastal state, roughly half of all states in the nation, benefit from these programs. 
Uh, in in my view, we should be doubling down on them because these are these are communities that are really at risk. That's what I'm going to advocate as part of this committee. And I'm not going to ask you to defend the proposed cuts uh, to these programs, um, but I would like you to tell the committee how these cuts would affect NOAA's ability to continue to protect vulnerable coastal communities. Sure, Congressman. I, and I again have deep appreciation for your interest and support of these of the coastal zone management programs and resiliency. Uh, uh, efforts that will be reduced. It, again, um, we are not uh, eliminating all our coastal work and support, if you will. I mentioned this to Congressman Meng uh, that I've been a coastal state resident in three states and several countries, so I, and I live on the Chesapeake Bay, so I very much appreciate these programs. And, and I'll tell you, there is good work that will continue. Uh, habitat restoration, for example, in Louisiana, I visited a, a restored marsh that had been underwater for decades that we, we restored, and, uh, and that, is a, that provided an effective storm surge barrier during this hurricane season to the, the residents of that state. And your state, uh, there's great work we're doing too. We've restored a, an estuary in your district, I believe, that uh, is now a very active sa for uh, the salmon um, hatchery. And, uh, and so the, um, there, we will continue good work and we just had to make reductions. Um, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate the time. I, I will just say, as I yield back, the, um, I was in Westport and visited the Coast Guard station there and was meeting with a group of uh, Guard members and uh, their families and asked them what's keeping you up at night. And the n a number of people who mentioned the risk of tsunami was really significant. Well, and, and that's great, sir. I, I'll say, though, again, we, conti we continue to fund our tsunami program in this budget. It's reduced but not eliminated. And I think the, the men and women that are, are working at our tsunami warning centers are, are experts uh, doing very good work. And we will, it's important for us to continue that capability. I agree. Thanks. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, Admiral. It's an honor to have you here. Um, I'm uh, from West Virginia, and NOAA has made a, a real investment in our state. One of your supercomputers is in Fairmont, West Virginia, and that's been an important driver of uh, uh, high-tech talent into our state coming out of our universities and uh, bringing people to West Virginia. Can you give me any sense of kind of NOAA's uh, view of that uh, positioning in West Virginia and the supercomputer and your investment in our state and the future uh, that you see of NOAA in West Virginia, uh, that facility in Fairmont in particular. Uh, yes, Congressman, and thank you for your interest and support again. Um, and I and definitely uh, I've enjoyed your state. I'm going to be visiting it next month for the Eagle Horizon exercise. That's our, our backup site, for, if you will, for when we uh, have to to continuity of operations, and I look forward to that time. Uh, and and uh, our, our supercomputing capability there is important to us. It's uh, foundational for our, 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 our numerical or high-performance high, uh, high computing numerical weather prediction. And, uh, and so we will maintain our presence in your state because that capability is so important. Great. Thank you. There was a proposal for uh, 10 years worth of contracted work uh, in the $533 million range. I appreciate your comments about the continued commitment to West Virginia. On your radar screen, some of this uh, uh, potential contracted work, uh, uh, half a billion dollars in West Virginia at this facility. Uh, your familiarity, what the game plan is, and uh, what the outlook is. Well, sir, I actually can't comment. I'm, I'm not. A, I'll have to take this for the record on what our exact uh, in the FY19 budget, what our our program funds are for, and our plans going forward in the future. I, I don't recall the numbers, and and so I'll have to have to come back to you with that one. Great. Thank you. I have no further uh, questions. Thank you for being here. I understand we've had two rounds already. So, uh, unless there's nothing else, I'll move that this hearing is adjourned. You know, I, I, I've been in Pennsylvania several times, I don't think you're in the district, but you are the center of gravity for uh, meteorology, you know, in the country your state is. We're actually the nerve center for the entire world. No, that, that's pretty <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, thanks for your questions. I, I definitely understand all your interests in this and you know my bio, so we'll work together. I mean, yeah. thank, thanks for your support for NOAA and appropriations for your